This is a quick response to uh, Jeff Cosmo's video on consciousness and quantum voodoo, which in turn was a uh, was posted as a response to one of my videos on the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, what you seem to be claiming there, Jeff, is a couple of things. Firstly, you seem to be claiming uh, or repeating claims that you made in some of your other videos about a solution, what you claim is a solution to the hard problem, uh, and I want to address that because I don't think it is a solution. And I also think, uh, firstly, I think I've been mischaracterized, or, or maybe I just didn't explain myself properly in my video. But I, th I think you've interpreted what I said incorrectly, uh, or as I say, I maybe have ex ex expressed it inadequately. But I think I just want to clear that up a little bit. Uh, and then I just want to mention some, just to pick up on some bits that you said in your video, which suggests to me that not only have I don't, not only have you not solved the problem of the hard problem of consciousness, but your um, you're operating in a way which is, uh, is is deeply dualist and as um, as grounded in a kind of Cartesian dualism as the uh, the ideas that you seem to be refuting. First off, just this thing about the the hard problem. Well, let me just let me just uh, clarify what I'm talking about first, or what I'm not talking about, and and some extensions of that. You seem to be under the impression that I'm supporting uh, a quantum mechanical explanation for consciousness. And I'm not doing that, and quite frankly, I, do, I, I don't know. I mean, I have no idea whether consciousness emerges from quantum mechanical processes. I know there are some people who think that, uh, Stuart Hammeroff and uh, Roger Penrose, amongst others. Who knows? I mean, I, I, I find it very unconvincing, personally, but I, it's not my field, so it, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Uh, but, I, but it certainly doesn't represent my, posi my position. That's, that's not what I was saying. I was just using that as an illustration of the kinds of solutions that are brought forth. Um, as I, I mean, by that I mean uh, scientific or uh, yeah empirical kinds of solutions as opposed to metaphysical or cosmological solutions. Uh, okay, second thing is this: you you talk for a while about my use of the word computation in relation to consciousness, and uh, illustrate that uh, that view of computation by showing complex mathematical equations. And I certainly wouldn't do that. I mean, uh, yes, I absolutely believe that there is computation going on in the brain. That isn't the same thing as calculation going on in the brain, and nor is it the same thing as going on in the kinds of computers that were built to solve the kinds of mathematical equations that you were putting up. Those those kinds of equations would be solvable by a computer 50, 60 years ago. Um, in other words, very simple computation. The sort of computation that... Um, that I can do on my mobile phone right now. And I certainly wouldn't say that the brain is as simple as a mobile phone. Um, but it isn't the same thing as saying that it isn't doing computation. Computation is almost ubiquitous. I mean, it's, it's, it, it happens all the time. You know, therm my thermostat is a basic computer. So the idea that my brain would not be performing computation is, is, is to me, a little bit absurd, really. It is performing computation, undoubtedly. It may be doing other things. There, there may be doing what Roger Penrose referred to as the non-computable or something like that. He uses this kind of phrase, but he but he's talking about the quantum, so I don't really want to go there. But, um, yeah, of course my brain's computing. Of course it is, and, my, and lots of other parts of my body are computing. They're carrying out all kinds of computational activity. Um, and quite honestly, I'd like the electromagnetic activity that you uh, talk about at length is a computational process. You would need computation to take place in order for the electromagnetic magnetic activity you talk about to function. So th there is undoubtedly computation going on. It's not simple mathematical computation that took place, you know, that you could, as I say, you could do in an old um, Sinclair spectrum or something like that. It's much more sophisticated than that. Uh, and if you want evidence of that, you know, just you know, try playing Grand Theft Auto or try playing a game of, um, what's it called, uh, World of Warcraft, something like that. I mean, that's computation. That's what computation is like. It has, it has that kind of quality. But that's the kind of computation that's taking place in a really simple, even the, even the most sophisticated computers of today that you play World of Warcraft on are simple compared to the brain or to the brain of a newt or something. So, um, so yes, of course they compute. I don't think... It, but but characterising computation as something that you could that happened in beige boxes 60 years ago. It, it doesn't really capture it, I don't think, really. Um, okay, now, the, so that's that's just in response to, to what you said about my video. I, I, 
the brain undoubtedly computes. Maybe it does quantum computing, maybe it doesn't. I don't, I'm not married to that idea, but either way, that's, that's, that's my position on that. But, but, but neither of those, you know, whether it computes or not, or whether it does quantum mechanical processes or not, is irrelevant in terms of the hard problem. And I think, the, and to be honest with you, not, it's so is electromagnetic activity. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying that is, is, I think at least partially, you're either misunderstanding or misinterpreting the hard problem. I mean, what you say in one of your videos is, is, and this is one of your definitions you give for the hard problem, you say, how do physical things, things that we can see and touch, produce a phenomenon that is invisible, intangible, diaphanous and ethereal? Now that's what you say is the hard problem. But that isn't the hard problem. The hard problem is not you know, how these physical things that we can see and touch have an ethereal quality. It's not. It's, the point is that how can we see and touch and feel these things? That's the hard problem. Why, how is there such a thing as, as the experience as we call seeing and touching and tasting? That, that's the hard problem. If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're talking about some kind of phenom accompanying phenomenon which you describe as invisible, intangible, diaphanous and ethereal, then yes, that's that's dualism. You're citing dualism right there, and uh, and no one's saying that. And that's that's not what the hard problem's about. The hard problem is why do we have these things called feelings, tastes, touches, and so on? It's compounded a little bit, I think, in some of your videos. Maybe it's this one. Maybe it's a different one, because at a certain point you say that. Let me get this right. Is that you say something like. Um, uh, and you're talking about electromagnetic activity. You seem to be suggest suggesting that it allows. It, what's the word? You use the words escape, transcend, and defy our measuring instruments in pursuit of what you call something like a qualianic essence. I don't know if that's a quotation or that's your own term. Something that escapes or transcends or defies our measuring instruments is inherently dualist. Our senses, our hands, our, our taste buds, our eyes, our ears, our sense of not, these are, these are measuring instruments. So if you're talking about something which transcends measuring instruments, you're, mo you're inherently into dualist territory. And using words like electromagnetic activity, producing some kind of emergent wholeness, that you, you're talking about a dualism that has an emergent quality. So I think I think there's a, a bit of slippage in either, either in your language there, or possibly in the understanding that you bring into this, or in what you in, in the specific focus that you want to take away from this stuff. Uh, okay, so I think I think that's pretty much all I want to say really. Um, I do think the hard problem exists, and I'm not going to pretend for one second that my original video that you're responding to was either a, a coherent or a particularly well expressed. Um, statement of it, that's not, that's not really what it was about, it was me trying to, to search for an a, a, a understanding of it in my own terms. But I don't think you've solved it, and I don't think the, or if you take your comments on my video are, are valid really. And and to be honest with you, I think it stems from this, this question about physicality. If I can just return to this little quotation just for a moment, how do physical things Things that we can see and, t and touch produce a phenomenon that is invisible, intangible, diaphanous, and ethereal. I mean, it sounds to me like you're quite hung up on, on a particular understanding of what constitutes physicality and the physical. Because you seem to be making a distinction between uh, EM phenomenon, which you talk about quite extensively and in fairly rhapsodic terms. You seem to be making a distinction between that phenomenon and the physical, which you're characterizing stereotypically as billiard balls banging into one another in a crudely kind of Newtonian sense. But EM activity, electromagnetism, is a physical force. It's as physical, as um, material, as substantive, as, as this table, as this camera, as the tree outside my window, as the billiard balls that you talk about. So you don't really escape physicality by citing electromagnetic activity just because electromagnetic activity is invisible. And I think that's what's going on there. I think you're confusing uh, invisibility and intangibility and you know the non-appearance of certain phenomena on the surface of the senses with um, ethereality, and they're not the same thing. EM activity is a physical, is as physical as everything else. Um, 
Although I will admit, and I think I think you've got some good points here. I think I, I would admit that some um, descriptions of natural phenomena lend themselves to a to a simpler kind of intuitive grasp, or at least on an initial level. It's certainly easier for me, for example, to imagine my consciousness a bit like light, or a bit like lightning, or a bit like a gas, or something gaseous and ethereal and ephemeral, and those kind of words. It's a little bit my imagination functions easier in that within that connection but but it's just an intuition it, it doesn't lend it you can't go much further with that as soon as I try to to expand it so for example talking about what EM phenomena really are of course the analogy falls apart because it's not it's not really there it's just a poetic aid to imagination Okay, thanks very much for that. I'm sorry if this sounds a bit critical. I do enjoy your video, but I, I, I think you're off the mark on this one. But thanks very much.